Um, was in pro uh, professional wrestling for 20 years, and then he tagged into comedy. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Tate Griffin! Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. How's everybody doing tonight? I decided to get into stand-up comedy over pro wrestling because I found it's better to get hurt emotionally than physically at the same time. My name is Tate Griffin, I am 6'5", I weigh 325 pounds, and I drive a 1991 Geo Metro LSI convertible. <laughs> yep, it's, it's this big. I put it on more so than drive it. And my wife says that when the top's down and my hair's up like this, I look like a Happy Meal toy. <laughs> so there's that. My teenage daughter's a lot more brutal. She's like, you don't look like a Happy Meal toy, Dad. You look like Jason Momoa gave the hell up. <laughs> I sense from your ridiculing laughter that you agree. <laughs> She's like, yeah, that's exactly, I was thinking it before you said it. <laughs> I'm in uh, the worst shape of my life, but I'm more financially secure than I've ever been. Those two facts were never brought more sharply into focus than yesterday when I spilled a pocket full of change in the ground and I only bent over to pick up the quarters. <laughs> Anybody else been there? It's bad news. <laughs> My wife and I just celebrated our 21st wedding anniversary. She deserves 100% of that applause. Yeah, she was the one that pointed out, she said, that means our, our marriage is old enough to drink. <laughs> We flew down to Epcot and got shit hammered in every country. <laughs> it's really good times, really good stuff. She's a psychotherapist. She just got her degree at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Hey, keep applauding so I don't feel bad about the fact that I owe the government a quarter of a million dollars. Yeah, great. It's, <laughs> it's great stuff. It's good stuff. No, she gets a little bit dark. Um, uh, anybody here a fan of Fails? You guys watch Fail Army on YouTube? You know what I'm talking about? People getting hurt. Yeah. Yeah. It's good stuff. I love fails. And I'm like, I, especially when they combine them. Like, I want to see a guy getting hit in the nuts with a snowball while he's falling off a trampoline. That kind of thing. <laughs> like, double that stuff up. And I'm telling her, I'm like, what kind of fails do you want to watch? She's like, those are stupid. I'm like, just pick something. She's like, all right. Swimming fails. Oh, shit. <laughs> when you fail at swimming, you drown. <laughs> Airplane fails. <laughs> That's a crash. <laughs> My children, though, uh, they're getting to that age where they're starting to figure it out. My applause, who here has kids? <laughs> now keep, keep, keep laughing if your children are old enough to figure out that you're not that great. <laughs> See, that's where my kids are. My son's 19 years old. We're going into Walmart the other day. We're walking down the dairy aisle. He immediately, stand there, goes through, looks over, he's like, They quit making Trix yogurt. <laughs> I'm like, what? He's like, they quit making Trix yogurt. For those of you that don't know, there's an artificially flavored and sweetened cereal, Trix, with a rabbit with the eyebrows. Well, they turn that into an artificially flavored and sweetened yogurt. <laughs> and they made this in 2000. He was born in 2002, so he does not know a world where Trix yogurt does not exist. And he is now facing a serious crisis. <laughs> In an effort to help him while still making him, you know, face the tough truths, my wife says, hey, don't worry about it. You'll find the older you get, the more you have to say goodbye to forever. Today it's Trix Yogurt, tomorrow it's your parents. <laughs> One day it'll be your dignity. I'm like, all right, that's enough. I'm like, bring this around. She's like, look, you don't have to feel that bad. One day you won't have to say goodbye to anything because everything you ever loved will already be gone. I'm like, I think he's going to need a different therapist. <laughs> We don't dial it down. Walked in, she was playing Grand Theft Auto the other day. Anybody like Grand Theft Auto, the game? Good times? Yeah. My kids play that. I need to turn it off the damn TV. Well, if you play it, you know the fun therapeutic part is just to run over a bunch of people and, and you know, avoid the missions. I come in and my wife is playing, but she's driving real slow and she's bumping into people. You know, like shooting somebody in the foot. You know? Just smacking around, that kind of thing, and then just leaving. Like, what are you doing? She's like, I'm giving everybody in this game PTSD. Like, that's, that's pretty awful. It's like, there's a therapist in San Andreas that's going to make a lot of money. Wow, that's, that's something. 
I found the other day that I have road rage. I just found that out. I just found that out because I live in a town with one road and it's hard to know that you have road rage when there's only one road. I was actually driving down to Nashville. And I don't know about you guys, but if you have road rage like I do, I find the only way to calm down is to fantasize about the horrible things that could happen to the person that I perceive as screwing me over on the highway. Perfect example. I'm driving down there, and this guy on a crotch rocket, one of those little motorcycles goes flying by me, and it scared the shit out of me, and then it pissed me off because it scared the shit out of me. So I calmed down over the last, the next five minutes by thinking about it. It's like, okay, well, he flies by me, he flies by the car in front of me, slams into the car in front of them. Car in front of me runs over him. That car stops and gets out, walks down. It's that dude's mom. She was already the store to buy him a birthday present. It was a damn helmet. That's how I get by. That's how I, that's how I start feeling just a little bit better. So, yeah, I was going down to Nashville. Anybody been to Nashville? Awesome. You'll find if you get down there, especially every single retail outlet seems to have the word barn in it. I started keeping a list. It was like a boot barn, bench barn, bike barn, yarn barn, beer barn, bagel barn, brisket barn, bonsai barn, beauty barn, better barn, and a best barn. And the better barn's better than the best barn. The best barn's the second best barn. But they don't call the better barn the best barn, or the best barn the second best barn. They call the better barn the better barn, and the best barn the best barn, because if they didn't, people would get confused. They also had a barn barn. You know what they sold there? Smaller frickin' barns. Yeah. It was good times. Like I said, I live in a small town in West Virginia. Uh, anybody been to West Virginia? Anybody know what I'm talking about? It's good times. My friends, my family, everybody I ever grew up with, they all have the same syntax. And that is that if they're real happy about something, their top lip will stop touching their teeth. <laughs> I just won me some Kenny Chisney tickets on the WROC radio station. It's obstructed view, but it's gonna be awesome. Conversely, if they're upset about something, it's their bottom lip that does not touch. What the hell you mean I can't bring this Walmart gift card back for cash? <laughs> Terrible. It's, it's absolutely terrible. Terrible, terrible stuff. <laughs> I was talking to my wife the other day about uh, my funeral. I'd come back from a show when I was dying. I thought, oh, well, let's talk about that. I said, you know, if we ever, if we, if we have money and everything's great, then, you know, I, I have some wishes. If we don't, don't even claim the body. But, but if we do, you know, there's a few things I'd like to have. You know, they say, oh, when I die, I want to have like a, a celebration of my life. No, I want everybody to feel awkward, socially. I want there to be a Sunday bar at my viewing. Like, seriously, think about that. Like, ice cream? How can you be upset at a, at a funeral if you're getting a Sunday? And if you can, then you're a real wet blanket, because I'm dead and you have free topics. Now, come on. Ooh, I also want there to be a, a barber out there so you can get a haircut. So Sony walks in and like, where did you get that haircut? Tate's funeral. It was an open casket, I got a fade. I don't know what that has to do with anything, but it's good stuff. Yeah. Oh, I also want some pseudo-celebrity mourners. Like, I know I'll go into the great beyond feeling a lot better if I know that somewhere in my house there's a great big picture of my wife in front of my casket crying her eyes out while she's being consoled and holding hands with a Hamburglar. Something like that. <laughs> and the last thing I had, I was going to uh, want the, uh, the MC, the DJ, whoever's up front, I don't know, the religious guy, say, you know, Tate Griffin's final request was that we take this beach ball and we bounce it around the room. <laughs> and as a tribute and testament to his life, we do not let it touch the ground for the entirety of the ceremony. <laughs> I'm thinking about my mom. She's like, I can't believe he's gone. <laughs> my brother's like, are you freaking kidding me? I think I have a day off of work for this bunch of bull. <laughs> my best friend's like, hey, how long do you think we should wait for trying to screw his life? 
was a pro wrestler for 20 years, so uh, in that spirit, I want all the pallbearers to be midgets. <laughs> Any wrestling fans here? My applause. Any wrestling fans? Yeah? You guys remember The Undertaker's manager, Paul Bearer? I want at least one of them doing that. No context at all, walking me to the grave going, Oh, yes! Oh, yes! It's almost actual, but not quite. Didn't mean to look right in the eyes when I said that. But I'm, I'm sorry. We'll just pass that on. Um, I had a couple of shows. It was funny. In, in the span of two weeks, I had the worst show I ever had and the best show I ever had. Can I tell you guys about that? Yeah. All right. Okay. Cool. <laughs> well, it's yours too. <laughs> so the uh, worst show I ever had, I was in Indiana and they put a casino in the middle of nowhere so that all the old folks that are at the casino have no choice but to spend all their money there. There's nothing else to do in any direction. So these poor people have to come and sit and listen to me. And I'm doing a 30 minute set. And I come up to the front and I'm starting and I go about five minutes in and none of these folks are making a sound. None of them are doing anything. They're not laughing, they're not booing, they're not talking. They're not breathing heavy. It's almost as if the level of my unfunniness has put them in a state of suspended animation. <laughs> and it's, it's getting to me. You ever been like a church or school or wherever and you're giving a speech or you're talking in front of people and it's not working and you start feeling the butterflies in your stomach? That's where I'm at in five minutes and I got 25 more minutes to go. So over the next five minutes, I'm just marinating in the heart. And I'm trying to figure out what I can do. And after about 10 minutes, I just accept it. And I'm like thinking about it, I'm embracing it. And I start to hear something. Every single time I tell a joke and no one responds in any way, I'm hearing something in my head and I identify it. It's the Price is Right theme. <laughs> and it's not the happy-go-lucky Price is Right theme. It's not you're going to the showcase showdown or you just want a car. That'll be, it's the bummer remix. <laughs> It's the soundtrack to Heartbreak and Impotence. And that's what I'm hearing. Like little, little yodelers falling off the cliff every single time. So I try to tell everybody, I'm thinking, well, I'll make a connection with them. That's what's going on with me. That's my truth. I'm going to share that with them. So I'm going to tell you guys what I told them, okay? A little cosplay. I'm like, look, folks, you're not laughing at anything, and I get it. I'm trying to make a connection every single time that I tell a joke, and you don't respond in any way. I'm hearing the bummer remix of the Price is Right thing. So we're going to do it together in an effort to make a connection. So I'm going to do the first part, and you guys are going to do the hmm. Ready? Okay? Wow. And that's what they did after every damn joke I told them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I'm starting to pick up a, a a pattern here. It really sucks for me. You guys are enjoying it. I'm okay with that. that that's good stuff. Can I tell you about the best one? Yeah. The best show ever. So about, I'm going to say about a week before the pandemic started, I had released an album and had a whole slew of shows. I was super, super stoked about this record. I worked for three years on it, doing five and seven minute sets all over the place, just trying to build up this material. And I had one shot to record the record. I was in a, in a theater, it held about 100 people. I put a lot of my time and energy and money, everything I could, and I only got one crack at it. I thought, okay, this, this has to go well. And the day before I was to record that album, I get a call in Cumberland, Maryland, from uh, an old folks nursing home. They said, hey, we heard you're a stand-up comedian. Would you mind coming over and, and doing your stand-up for us? And I thought, well, this is just perfect. I can do my whole show for an hour the day before I have to record it, like a complete dress rehearsal, you know, run through all the material, I was super stoked, I'm like, yes, I'll absolutely be there. So, I roll over to the, uh, to the nursing home, when I get there, there's a man who looks to be about 70 years old, and he is six foot ten. I'm like, hey, how are you doing? And the nurse said, well, that's Wally, he hasn't audibly made a noise in ten years. Well, hey, I'm really glad he's at the goddamn comedy show. <laughs> That's cool. It's like, well, no, just go on in right around the corner. So I turn the corner and it is pandemonium. It is crazy. There is a woman that does not look structurally possible. I'm guessing she's 200 years old and made a used Kleenex. And she is losing her mind because there is another person there that is wearing a Pittsburgh Steelers jer jersey, a 
Baltimore Ravens hat and a Washington Redskins jacket. <laughs> She's losing her shit. She cannot handle it. You can't, you can't do that. Ah! And it's like exhaling, just the yelling and the screaming. So I'm standing there watching this happen. And some of the people are on her side, and some of the people are standing with the, the poor gentleman wearing all this, and the rest of these people are eating checkers. And I'm, I'm waiting for it to die down, and you can see this moment when she stops screaming and being angry, and she starts to like calm down and be almost apologetic. It's like, okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I just, I don't know how you can do Steelers, Redskins, I'm sorry. And just as soon as she calms down, one of the folks go, Hey, maybe he just likes football. Screw you! And she starts all over again. So they finally calm her down, and they're like, hey, it's time for the comic stylings of Tate Griffin. So I get to go up to that. And I talk for about an hour, and I do some of the jokes you folks heard, and I get to the very end, and I go to take a drink, and just as I pick up the class, clear as a bell, I hear this woman in the back of the room go, <laughs> oh, wait a minute, I get it. You only bent over to pick up the quarters on a can of your fat and lazy. <laughs> and that was funnier than anything I had said then or now. So I said then what I'm saying now. My name is Tate Griffin. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much. Let's hear it for our host.